This video is brought to you by my awesome sponsors. Make sure to check out the affiliate links in the description below. Thanks again for all the support. Have you ever seen the comment section under any Twitter post a AAA developer may have made in reference to their game recently? This game is terrible. No creativity. I want my money back. I honestly could keep going, but at what point do you have to ask, if everyone hates how AAA games turn out, why do they still sell? Maybe it's a situation where the loudest voices are often the most strongest objecting opinions, but these games sell millions. The comments in the example listed are under recent Forza Horizon 5 posts, a game that boasts 28 million players at the end of last month and made $55 million on Steam alone in the first month. Hello and welcome to the channel, my name is Matt and I am one of those players. Even though I like a lot of aspects about Forza Horizon 5, I find myself in an ever-growing group of people who are tired of large developers either over-promising things that are inevitably that they don't deliver on, or simply just don't communicate. Recent examples of this primarily in the racing games genre are Need for Speed, who promised upcoming series of post-launch updates and expansion packs, with the first update focusing on expanding social play features. Well, it didn't, and we haven't heard anything since their tiny bug-fixing patch in late January. Forza Horizon 5. Since Playground Games was acquired by Microsoft in 2018, they haven't added anything creatively that has pushed their boundaries. Instead, they've re-added cars that have appeared in previous games, and their two DLC packs for the game are a Rally expansion and a Hot Wheels-based expansion. Both expansions are incredibly similar in scope to the other DLCs released for Forza Horizon 1 and Forza Horizon 3, respectively. Forza Motorsport. Originally planned to take three years to rework the franchise and launch with the Xbox Series S and X in November 2020. However, it is now March 2023, and still no concrete release date has been announced in six years after the franchise's most recent release. Communication has been nearly non-existent apart from the annual highly edited trailer reel stream that only reveals the graphics of the game and nothing of substance in regards to the features or the gameplay. And these are far from the only games that are experiencing the same disconnect from marketing to what is actually being shipped to the fans. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I thought I would take a step back here and clarify. What is Triple A? In the video game industry, the size and skill of developers has often been described as either indie or triple A. A common misconception that you may have heard is that indie could be anything from a hundred or less employees, and then sometimes you may have more to be considered triple A. So this is not true. These classifications for starters are not official, and the numbers are have never been official by any stretch of the imagination. If anything else, these unofficial classifications exist to loosely define a studio's funding or where the money is coming from. For instance, indie is for short for independent, meaning a studio has full creative control over the project and is not actually owned by any publisher. Triple A, for instance, in contrast, means a studio that's typically owned by a larger publisher who has massive development and marketing budgets, however, may be beholden to the almighty investor. The main takeaway I have between the difference of indie developers and triple A developers is mainly mobility. If there is a game-breaking bug, a AAA developer would most likely have to be informed by the marketing team about when their interactions on social media go sour, and then there would be various meetings between marketing teams and managers of the publisher to the developers, the lead developers, to the investors at the publisher, and it goes on and goes on before any actual work has been put down to actually fix said bug. 
for an indie developer, they could easily and quickly communicate that there's an issue that has happened and begin working on it almost immediately. I should clarify, I in any way, shape or form am not a video gaming journalist, nor have I had any experience in the video gaming industry as far as reporting on the actual behind the scenes. So this entire video is an opinion piece. So take absolutely everything I say with a ginormous grain of salt. To get back to the topic at hand, the biggest issue that I personally have with the video gaming industry as a whole, indie and AAA, is marketing and primarily expectations. Who here remembers E3? Nope, me neither. We've all seen those games that have incredible presentations at game conferences with photorealistic graphics, jaw-dropping sound design, the whole nine. But when it finally ships, how come the game doesn't look, feel, and play like the trailer we saw over a year ago? Shouldn't the game look better than the trailer? It all comes down to money. The investors. This glorified professional version of a bait and switch is probably the biggest cons in video game history. When investors realized the video game industry was just another quarterly growth game investors could play. When some of the top salesmen entered the video gaming industry, they figured out that upselling quantifiable performance metrics on how the game runs, showcasing photorealistic pre-rendered trailers, and blasting our ears with the same generic cinematic Hollywood-esque music, all of that together would basically guarantee a sale. What we stupid consumers kind of forgot to ask is, how does it feel to play? How does it feel to control the game? How does the game itself, how's the experience feel when I actually play it? This non-quantifiable aspect is virtually never considered until we as consumers actually get our hands on the game. And then when we finally do, it turns out to be the exact same story with the exact same cues crammed into the same 30 hour RPG or the same 20 hour racing game. Seems like all video games these days are kind of meshing into the same kind of thing. They're all the same. It's kind of odd. To understand why all of this happens, we have to look in the world of economics from an investor's point of view. Most investors do not want risks. They want to put their money into a large, well-known brand, optimize the company to become more efficient and spend less money, continue turning out the same product as it was shown to be able to sell before, and then the re investor reaps the rewards of their cost-saving measures in the form of quarterly-based profits. Think fast food, for instance. We as consumers go to a restaurant, spend a little of our time, a little of our money, and get somewhat decent food, leave, and then show up again sometime next week. This process makes for consistent sales and investors look at ways to maximize their return on investments. You start making the process more efficient, cut out overhead, find cheaper ingredients or treat cheaper ways to manufacture the food. When you can't refine the process any further, you start cutting staff, asking people to work harder and even perform multiple people's jobs for the same wage. The only problem with that fast food mindset is when you apply it to the video gaming industry, you cannot consume video games in the same way that you consume food. Food you have to go back to time and time again to get that same feeling, that same taste, and thus having to spend money every time you experience it. Video games you can experience as many times as you want. For free, you can come and go as you please, but you have to pay a one-time entrance fee to get in for the first time. As a very odd, off-the-wall kind of metaphor, imagine you had access to a never-ending cheeseburger in your refrigerator. Would you really ever want to go out and buy another Infinity cheeseburger with the same flavors? You wouldn't. You absolutely wouldn't. What you would do, you would go out and go find an Infinity Taco, for instance. Or at least, if you were to find another cheeseburger, you'd want to find another Infinity Cheeseburger that had different ingredients and different spices or something. And here lies the underlying problem with modern day video gaming. Consumers want a similar experience, but not the exact 
same. They want something that is similar, but yet different. They want something that is different enough that reminds them of the awe and the mystery of the first time they played a game, but yet it is still familiar to that franchise. Investors, however, want the literal exact game, slightly better graphics, and a new number slapped on the front of the cover. And they want that to be released time and time and time and time again. Because if you think of your fast food restaurant kind of metaphor, it's the same exact product. You can refine the process to be able to turn it out consistently and people know exactly what it's like whenever they go you know, purchase that product. They want to make that in the video gaming industry. They want to make the exact same game so consumers know exactly what they're getting into. The only problem with that is that over time, consumers get bored. So with the fast food metaphor, people might want to change restaurants. People, there are probably some crazy people who actually will like want to keep buying the same thing for every meal of every day. They'll eventually get burned out if there's if it's just the same thing. So they want a familiar feeling, but enough options to be able to keep coming back. And when you have the same game being released constantly, people are going to get bored of it. And then your sales will fall because it's the same thing. So back to the video topic at hand. Why are AAA games not, not the future? My predictions are that in the next decade or so, AAA developers will continue to make games under increasingly more stringent and demanding environments until they either give up or the investors do. If you start developing a brand new blockbuster game right now and you have the resources and the staff to hit the ground running, you will not release the game until PlayStation 6 is out. Or more specifically, probably at least until 2028. So investors who are looking at their spreadsheets and looking at the numbers on the spreadsheets will see five years of massive expenses going right out the door to maybe, maybe make a decent game that will sell a couple million copies in five years. At that point, with the cost of R&D, multiple game engine upgrades, the cost of staff and their said benefits, investors will have absolutely no return on their investments for a huge amount of time for the chance at being able to break even at when it all pans out. So that leaves the indie developers. With the invention of streaming services like Twitch and YouTube and TikTok, games like Minecraft and Among Us have popped out of the woodwork and became global superstars for a very long time before even any big publishers get involved. Getting talented personalities to show off these brand new, not very well-known games can bring a massive fan base to these in developers overnight, and they wouldn't even need a marketing budget at all. They can stay focused on perfecting their game and running a Twitter account or TikTok on the side to gauge if the community really enjoyed their last update or not. The future will bring more indie developers and indie games to video gaming's main stage than ever before in my mind. And that's because consumers want something new, something unique, something they haven't seen before. Even better, consumers will then only be a tweet away from being able to tell if a brand new update's on the way and without having to go through some weird unpaid intern that's at the mercy of their corporate employer. I really do think that in the future, video game engines will then be optimized so far that it'll be able to take a minimal amount of coding to create a photorealistic and incredibly beautiful game that you or me could probably make at home. I know it's a bit far-fetched, but it's probably coming sooner than we both think. In summary, a quote that I've often resonated with has been, During a gold rush, sell the shovels. I feel this quote can be very accurate in the next coming years as the big companies will continue to give us tools to make video games like the Unreal Engine, and then they'll be able to host the storefronts where we buy and sell our games. Of course, at every point of the process, they'll find a way to charge us money. 
but I think it'll be more on our terms than it'll ever be theirs. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Like I've said before, I'm not sure if I ever really want to make video essays like a brand new norm for the channel, but what I can tell you for a fact that will be a norm for this channel is I've got not one, but two new series coming on up. Uh, that would be called Retro Racing Reviews and Retro Racing Replays. With all the negativity surrounding video games at the moment, especially the racing game genre as a whole, I've been feeling rather depressed with the state of the world and how we'll never potentially be truly happy with whatever new game comes out from whatever new franchise. So I wanted to take a moment to take a step back and take a walk down memory lane and review some of uh, my favorite older games from my favorite, all-time favorite franchises. In the next few weeks time here, I'd like to start with the very, very first Need for Speed game, back when it even wasn't called Need for Speed. Again, thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you guys soon. Take care. Bye.